Welcome to our YouTube page. I'm Pastor AJ. This is my lovely wife, Pastor Tina. I am so excited that you visited our page. What you're going to find here is content related to how to build you up and encourage you, to edify you, to strengthen you. Amen. You're going to find the Word of God here, biblical principles for this time that we're living in. And listen, don't forget to subscribe to our page. Also, share it, comment, and listen, set a reminder so that anytime we post new content, you'll be the first to be notified. Amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you for uh, coming to our page. We love you. Glory to God. So many times we look at the package and the personality, but we miss, we, we miss it because we're not looking at the principle. Don't let the package or the personality cause you to miss the principle. Are you hearing me? Somebody hear me. Yep. That's right. Somebody say something. <laughs> but listen to this. What you dishonor, listen to this. What you dishonor moves away from you. What you honor moves closer. What you dishonor moves away. What you honor draws closer to you. If you dishonor what we say to you, we move away. Are you listening to me? Because the Bible says, do not, don't, do not what? cast your pearls before the what? Stop speaking words, the same words to people who are not listening anyway. It's called dishonor. And if you're going to dishonor what I'm saying, I'm going to stop saying it to you. I stop talking to people that don't listen. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. Respect is an attitude, but honor is an action. We respect you, but do you honor us? Respect is an attitude, honor is an action. We respect you, I know, but do you honor us? My objective in this series is to help every believer, every believer, understand the biblical principles about giving. That's what this series is about. It's about the power of the seed. And, 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 and we're, we haven't dove into all of the scriptures yet related to that, but I want to make sure that you understand uh, the big picture of what the Bible is saying as it relates to giving, sowing, you know, to your pastors, to in the church. We talked about tithing for the last uh, well, last week, really, we talked about it. Week prior to that, amen, have we, you know, we dove into some things. But everything that God has for us is in his word. Everything that God has for us is found in his word. And what happens is it takes pastors, it takes us to pull the jewels and the nuggets and things that are hidden out of the scripture to give to you so that you can increase Listen, people are riding in our cars, they riding in your jet, they living in your houses, they got your money in their account. According to the scripture, listen, we should be some of the most blessed people in the earth, according to the scripture. But a lot of times, the church don't want to talk about it, it's taboo. You know, it's a couple of things the church don't like to talk about, but they want it. They don't like to talk about sex, but they want plenty of it. And they don't like to talk about money, and they also want plenty of it. So why don't you want us to talk about it? Why are we hiding and scared and seem like some taboo? Yeah, those are things we want, but we don't say none. Well, we're going to say something because we know you want it. You want plenty of sex. You want plenty of money. So we talk about those things. I'm talking about in the covenant. Remember, we're going to stay with the word. Sex is legal when you're married. It's illegal if you're not married. And if you're illegal right now, you can get legal. You can get some papers. You understand? You can do the right thing. It's not condemnation. Don't be condemned. Romans 8 and 1 tells us there is now no condemnation of them. Let me read it to you. There is now no condemnation of them who walk. See, see we leave out a part. You condemning that. I ain't condemning you. You condemning yourself because of what you're doing. Let me, let me read what the Bible says. Remember, we're going to do what the Word says. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now, at this moment, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Then we, we, we miss the comma in the rest of that verse. Oh, there we go. Who do not what? Walk to the flesh, but after. So if I walk in the flesh, will I be condemned? In the flesh, according to the scripture. Nobody's, gonna, nobody's trying to condemn you. You're doing it to yourself by walking in the flesh, by doing fleshly stuff. You walk in the spirit, then you don't have to feel like you're condemned. Well, I felt like I'm condemned, Pastor. When you talk about money, are you tithing? Because if you're tithing, you're not going to sense any of that. So it's obvious if you're feeling some type of condemnation, it must be that you're not doing the right thing. You know, me and my wife had sex in church before marriage. We slipped up one time before we got married. And that Sunday when we came to church, oh my goodness, it was like God was speaking in the window. And he told the pastor exactly what we were doing the night before. And he said everything. I'm just like, who, who told him? Like, what is going on? God seen us. And he used the pastor to share some stuff with us so that we can do the right thing. Because, see, the world is not going to tell you to do the right thing. They're going to tell you to cover it up. Won't you just put a hat on it? You're going to be all right. But the Bible says to abstain. Is that true? Okay, okay. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. This, and, and there is no excuse just because I didn't abstain because we use that as well pastor you didn't abstain when you was younger nobody told me to either so what's your excuse because I won't raise in a family that taught me biblical principles from the word of God are you listening to me this morning all I'm saying is you held accountable for the things that you know I didn't know would God still judge me of course he would but I just didn't know at the time. But once I knew better, we did what? Once you know better, you do better. Is that right? Amen. So we don't teach principles here that we don't practice. We don't teach principles here that we don't practice. Everything we teach you is what we're walking in, is what we're living. Amen. It's not by faith. It's what we're living in and what we're walking in because we got to know the experience. Jesus said he was touched with all of our infirmities, meaning he understand what you're going through because he's been through it. Therefore, he can talk about it. And when we've been through a whole lot of things, it qualifies us to speak on it and talk about it. Can we, I'm not saying you can't teach the word of God, but I'm saying the principles that we share here, they are principles that we live and that we walk in. Amen? Amen. God wants each of us to be free from a poverty mindset. It's okay to have money in the church. You don't have to be broke in the church. I did not take a vow of poverty when I got saved, and you don't have to take a vow of poverty, amen. Yes, 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 there are crooked people in the church. There are crooked people in the world. There are crooked people everywhere. You got to know what God is connecting you to and what you're sitting up under, amen. And when you give, understand that when you give, you're not giving to man, you're giving to God. So if I messed up and jacked up all the money y'all gave to me, you ain't giving to me anyway. You gave it out of your pure heart with your pure motive to God and God will still bless you and honor you for doing that. Even though that's not going to like, happen here, we're not doing nothing crazy. But at the same time, if we were, when you give, you, because of your gift, this is how God increases you, not according to how the pastor is living. Amen? Amen? He brought you and I out of the kingdom of God, or brought us out of darkness so that we don't have to live a normal life. Say this after me. I do not, I do not. live. A normal, a normal mediocre, mediocre or average life average. there is nothing average, is nothing about, average. Me. about me amen amen yeah ain't nothing average about you 
Happy birthday, BJ. You in the house, BJ. Happy birthday, 10 years old. Boy, good to see you, my nephew in the house. He's 10 today. Or yesterday, rather. Praise God. Happy birthday. This is a birthday shout out. Okay. Amen. There is absolutely nothing that's normal about you. The Bible calls you a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a chosen generation. Come on now. First Peter 2 and 9, God calls you certain things. And so we have to embrace what God says about us and get an agreement with what God is saying about us. We live a supernatural life built on God's word and empowered by his spirit. A supernatural life, not a natural life. We are human beings. We are spirit beings having a human experience. We started in the spirit, and God uses the handling of money as a test to see where our priorities and our loyalties lie. He uses the handling of money to see what's priority in our life and what are we loyal to. Who are we loyal to? Your checkbook, your bank account will always tell you where your priority is. It's going to show you. You don't have to assume. It's going to tell you exactly where your priorities lie and what you're loyal to. Go back and check it out. It's going to speak to you. Amen? Look, we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. <laughs> you know, Jeremiah, Jeremiah is known as the, he's often known as the, uh, the weeping prophet. Because he stood alone in his time, he stood alone declaring the word of the Lord while his nation, while the nation continued to reject the path that led to life. They continued to reject what God is saying. So look, let's go to um, Jeremiah 3 and 15. This is what it says. It says, and King James Verse, it says, and I will, and I will, I will, who is I? Who are we talking about? This is God, right? I will give you, I will give you pastors or shepherds. Some translation says shepherds. This is King James. I will give you pastors or shepherds according to whose heart? According to his heart. Different translation says who are loyal to me or whom I'm pleased with. God said I'm going to give you pastors according to my heart who are loyal to me and who I am pleased with. Mm. It's according to his heart. Not according to prestige, not according to how many followers they have, you understand, what's their pedigree and all that kind of stuff. That has nothing to do with those that God chooses. Amen? I will give you pastors, shepherds according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. The pastors that God will give you is going to feed you. There shouldn't be any hungry sheep here at Kingdom Life Church. Because God has given you pastors, God has given you shepherds to feed you, meaning to sustain you or to supply, to supply, to supply you with everything that you need. Amen? So sheep must have a shepherd. According to the scripture, sheep must have a shepherd or a pastor. Is that true? Okay, I ain't trying to get you to agree with me. I want you to just read the scripture. Disagree with the Bible, that's all. I'm not going to trick you this morning. No test today. No test this morning. Sheep must have a shepherd. But you've often heard, and I've even heard people say, I don't need a pastor. I don't need a pastor. I can study at home. I can read at home. I can pray. I can do all the things I need to do. Why do I need a pastor? Because the Bible says. See, if you are a believer, you follow the word. If you are kind of a believer, like, I, you know, I'm, I, I, you know I, I think I am, I mean, well, you follow other stuff, but the believers follow the Bible. Am I correct, y'all? Am I, am I in the right place? Come on, online, give me some shout outs, say something, give me some hearts or something. Am I in the right place? If you are a believer, and the Bible says in Jeremiah 3.15 that I'm going to give you something, God says... I would give you pastors according to my heart that's going to feed you. I know you're feeding yourself, but are you really feeding yourself? Are you giving, man, if you ain't watch your children closely, imagine what they'll feed themselves. If you're not constantly there guiding them and helping them, what would they actually feed themselves? 
I'm going to eat crackers every morning. Some will just eat, you know what I'm saying? They're going to eat candy every day. You know, I know when we was growing up, my mom and I, you know, my brother here, and yeah, we, you know, we grew up and, you know, we, we go out and, and go from door to door and all that stuff and get our candy and stuff and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, we don't celebrate Halloween the way we used to, praise God. But, uh, but you know, we go out and uh, get candy and all that kind of stuff. And we come home, my mom would put all the candy together. And it would go in this big jar. And then she would ration out us. You know, we play cards for it and do different things, playing games and all that. We had a fun house, boy. We had fun times. And, and, uh, but, but you don't get the only candy. Like the candy ain't going to, that big bag of candy going to your room as a child. Like your little self think you're going to take 100 pieces of candy. Now I got to pay the dentist bill. You think you're going to take 100 pieces of candy, 12 packs of chewing gum, 15 Snickers, you understand? A hundred, you going to take, you going to trust a bag of candy with a child? And they did, look, I just want you to eat one a day, Johnny. I can't eat one a day now with the pack in my room. You understand? I keep looking at that thing. I'm like, man, let me get a Milky Way. Man, let me get a Musketeer. Like, dog, is somebody move the candy. Out of sight, out of mind. Move the candy off my desk. I'm going to move that candy off my I'm going to move it today. I'm going to move that candy off my desk. But, but children, sheep need a shepherd. We need leaders in our life to help instruct us. So we're born again. We need pastors. Jeremiah again. 20, look, Jeremiah 23. Look at Jeremiah 23. Verse 4 says this, again, still in Jeremiah, says, I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. Here's God, talk, again, talking through Jeremiah because, again, Jeremiah lived in a very wicked time. He wept so much because of the, just all the stuff that was going on in that time. And he's trying to get them back on the path that God has for them, and they're not listening. And so here now the scripture is saying, there's a good dream looking at me. She said, that's my uh, great uncle right there. You know, he said, look, you know, that he, he, he wants, to, wants to minister to them. And so says, I'm going to leave them pastors. I'm going to set up pastors. I know they're going to need pastors. Now, he spoke this a long time ago, and that didn't really happen, you understand, know, to the New Testament where Ephesians, in Ephesians. You know, after Jesus had passed and all that, and then they, you know, and Paul, is, God is using Paul to bring that thing right back again. Because if they never said it, we shouldn't be doing it. Right? I don't need a, if God don't say we need pastors, how, if you believe and I'm a believer and you say you don't need a pastor, why, why I need one? Why aren't we reading out the same book? Yeah, why, if you don't need church or to come to church, why I'm here? Aren't we reading out the same book? Well, so you need to help give me some information so I can be on the same page with you. Well, you come every other month or show up when you feel like it. As a believer, I'm, I'm talking to believers, talking to believers. That's all I'm saying. So God said, I will give you pastors to feed you, to feed you, to feed you. Man, hold your finger right there. I, I gave this to me. Turn to this. <laughs> Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel uh, real quick. Ezekiel 34, man. I was reading this stuff last night. I was like, oh, the other night. I was like, oh, my goodness. Ezekiel chapter 4. Let's read verses 2 through 5 real quick. It says this. It says, son of man. And he talked. This is another prophet. Son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you shepherds, look, who feed yourselves instead of the sheep. So there are a lot of shepherds in that day, and there may be some in this day. I'm not throwing a stone at all shepherds or all leaders or all pastors, but there are some who do not feed the sheep. They only feed themselves. And so that's why sometimes people see, like, why the pastor and them so blessed and the people struggling and my mama in poverty, my mama, da, because they're not being taught. They're not being taught. The pastor is feeding himself, but he's scared to feed them. Sometimes, depending on what denomination you're in, he can't say certain stuff. Come on now. 
Yeah. Well, I, I, I recently spoke with a pastor who's not at his church any longer because of something he, he said and wanted to do. And people didn't agree. You know, that's a sad commentary when people don't follow the word. God never told the deacon that they were over the pastor. Really, there's nobody over the pastor in the church. That's why pastors should have pastors. Now, we have a governing board. We have a board of trustees and all that. But there's, no, there's nobody going to tell me what to teach and what not to teach in this church. It don't matter how much money you give or don't give. Because I'm more afraid of God than you. Who are you? You can kill a body, but you can't kill it. You can't kill a body and put that soul in hell. But we have leaders that are under stress today because people want to control them. Leaders are not free to teach what they need to teach and what they need to say. And it's hurting the congregation. It's hurting the people. And that's why every now and then you hear me break out and say something. That, that, that you, <laughs> uh, yeah, other pastor, pastor, the only one saying that. Y'all had a, a guy call me and said, man, don't nobody talk like you talk in this city. I don't know why. I'm following the word of God, and I'm following what's going on in our culture. And you got to be brave and bold not to go with the flow in this culture. It's such a fickle culture. We got fickle believers following the world instead of the world following you. Who told you to follow the world, believer? Who told you to get in line behind people that don't love God and don't even know God, but yet you're going to champion their causes? What about the causes of Christ? What about the causes of Christ? When are you going to champion the cause of Christ? Look, we had a whole, uh, let me just say this. We had a whole lot to say. Believers, I'm all off my notes, Lord. That's how I get in trouble too sometimes. But I'm all off my notes. We had a whole lot to say about Black Lives Matter. We championed their fake, phony causes. But yet, when they, when, they, when they talked about abortion rights for these children, no Christian said nothing. You were so scared to voice your opinion then, but yet you will open your mouth to support an organization who was not for the family, not for the nuclear family, was totally against black people. Documentary this came out, they did not give one penny to the communities that were black. $90 million received and not a penny went to the black community. You know where it went? It went to where their mission statement said, what we tried to tell y'all years ago. It went to transgenderism. It went to sex changes. It went to sex toys. It went to all types of ungodly stuff. But yet we stood bold, blacked out our social media sites. It's a mockery and a shame that you will be quiet and silent when God is for babies. You scared. You that scared? They got you like that? That you are scared? You better stand up for the things of God, not the things of this world. I, look, I'm crucified with Christ. Whether I live or die, it's in Christ. And God is going to judge you for that. God is. Believers. Secret, secret stuff. Silent. Talking big in private and saying nothing in public. You scared. You scared. And you need to get over your scaredness. You need to get over your scaredness because sooner or later, all the cover's coming off of all y'all and all us. The cover's coming off and there's going to be a line in the sand. Who's going to be with the Lord and who's going to be on the other side? And we're going to find out how holy you are. We're going to find out where you are in your life. We're going to find out then, have you been in this secret place for real? Do you really know God? Jesus. Somebody need to hear that this morning. Online or in the building. 
God said prophesy against these shepherds. Yeah. That's probably what got it right there. Yeah, Kylie had me a little roused a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> prophesy against them shepherds. Leaders of Israel, get them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow waits you shepherds who feed yourselves instead of the flocks? Shouldn't shepherds feed the sheep? We have responsibility to care for and to feed the sheep. It's our responsibility to feed you. Every sheep, every, every person that's under our care, everybody who's connected to us, it's our responsibility to feed you. You ever seen a scared dog? I don't like scared dogs. I'm like, come on, man, come on. I'm going to make you tough. You hang around me, you're, gonna, you're not going to be scared. And you shouldn't be. I'm going to show you scripture on that. Everything we say we got scripture for. It's our assignment. It's not just to feed ourselves, but it's to feed the flock. Number three says this. Listen to this. You drink the milk. You wear the best. You live in the best. You eat the best. You butcher the best animals, but you let your flocks starve. This is a woe to the leaders because I want to balance it. I want to show you the bad side of what I do. The other side. So you can appreciate where you are too. And what you're under. So everything that's shine ain't gold. Because <laughs> they got on skinny pants and a tight shirt. That don't mean nothing. Skinny jeans. That would, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Pastor, you don't even know the lingo. I got it. I, I'm good now. Skinny jeans. Okay, I got you. <laughs> look, look what it says. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. You have not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. Not a kingdom life. Yeah, we go out there so much, y'all, you don't like it. Stop calling me. Stop texting me. Stop emailing. Why y'all asking this? Why you in my business? Why you want to know where I went? Why you want to know where I'm going? Why we da da da? Because the Bible says that we are responsible for you. We are. Now, we can't call every last one of y'all every day. That's why we have leaders in place to help. And they submit reports so we know the state of our flock. Why they calling me? Why they want to know where I'm at? Because you could be in the hospital. You could be sick. It's not just for them. Then we're going to know. And then we can pray and intercede. It could be a financial issue. Then we're going to know. Why are they following up with me? Man, I'm telling you, boy, I tell you. People are something else. You don't want this job unless you call to it. <laughs> I'm telling you, please, 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 please. I know somebody heard James Brown. Don't be singing that up in the church now. Don't be singing that in the church. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, there are people that don't understand the great lengths a true pastor will go to to know what's going on with the flock or to protect those that are under their care. This is why we hold you accountable. The accountability comes from the top, not from that director, not just from that person. It comes from us. You can always notice the culture of a ministry by what's happening in it. You can easily see it. Once you see what doesn't line up with us, you can speak to it and say, that ain't my pastor, huh? No, 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 no. My pastor don't do that. My pastor don't roll like that. That ain't my pastor. I don't know where you're getting that from, but that ain't my pastor. You're not flowing with the leadership. You'll be able to tell easily when any of the directors, anybody's out of order. Any, anybody. Why? Because you're going to know the culture of this ministry. You're going to know how we feel about you. And it should be flowing down to everybody. This is why we inquire again about your whereabouts. This is why we hold your camera, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, amen? Come on, let's, let's move on. Stay it, and stay it, and stay it, and stay it. You have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. He's talking to the pastors who's not doing a good job. So my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd. Scattered without a shepherd, and they are easy prey for any wild animals. Why would God say all this if he didn't think you need a shepherd? Why would he say that? Why he, why, he, why, why he's upset with these pastors who haven't gone after those that are lost or haven't gone after those that have wandered away? Why would, why would I bother with them, God? No, 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 no. It's their responsibility. It's their responsibility to reach out from time to time and to, and to pull people who have wandered away back into the fold, try our best. 
We say it in our men's ministry. Ain't nobody going to be lost except those that want to be. You want to be lost, we ain't going to be able to find you. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna lose yourself. You're going you're gonna to hide. You're going to let us find you. <laughs> God placed us in your life. Yeah, you're going to change your number. You're going to block us on Facebook. You're going to do all that stuff to get away. You understand? From the love that God has for you. Through the people that love you. And guess what? You're going to run into arms of people that don't love you. Happens all the time. God's placed us in your life to give you advantage, not take advantage. Man, let, I got to move on real quick. I got to move on real quick. Let, let me look at this real quick in Matthew. Media, can y'all get Zechariah chapter 10 while I'm doing this? Zechariah chapter 10, verse 2. Let's hold that. Hold that. That's, that's a good news translation. Good news translation. Yeah. Let me look at something in Matthew chapter 9 real quick. This is something Jesus said. Look, look at this. Matthew 9, 36. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. This is Jesus. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus was looking at people in his day who were scattered abroad. They were fainting because they didn't have a pastor in their life. They weren't making the right decisions because they didn't have a shepherd. They don't have a pastor. I don't need a pastor, not according to the word. According to your thinking and what everybody else say, but not according to the Bible. So now you know the Bible don't say that. Somebody ever tell you, uh-uh, that ain't what the Bible say. And leave it like that. Because they they're not going to follow the Bible, you have nothing to say to them. Are you listening to me? Yes. Believers follow the Bible. We, what else are we going to follow? We have to follow the word. We follow the scripture. You got that in uh, Zechariah real quick? Listen to this. Watch this. People consult idols and fortune tellers, but the answers they get are lies and nonsense. Some interpret dreams, but only mislead you. The comfort they give is useless. So the people wander about like lost sheep. They are in trouble. The Bible says they are in trouble because they have no leader. They have no shepherd. They have no pastor. They don't have a pastor. And they don't think they need one. Now, I've given you enough scriptures now. You can show them where they need it if they are believers. You're not a believer. You're not going to follow the Bible. We don't expect you to. But if you are a believer, you should be following the word. Amen? Yeah. It says they are in trouble because they have no shepherd. They have no leader. Not having a pastor or not having a pastor or a shepherd is not good. It's not good not to have a pastor. In Samuel, let me read this to you. Or let me just share this. In Samuel chapter 22, there were 200 men. Y'all know the story of David and those men. They were in distress. They were in debt. They were discontent. In Samuel chapter 2, these men ran to a cave, a cave called Adullam, because they were lost. They were hurt. They were depressed. They were in despair. They didn't know what to do, but God connected them to a shepherd. Did y'all know David was a shepherd? <laughs> Not just a king. He was a shepherd. They connected them to a leader. They connected them to a leader. And afterwards, some of them, a lot of them were known as David's mighty men. Just because of them being connected to this leader, things were better for them. Things were made better in their life. They were truly, they truly grew up because of that. Wow. Jeremiah 23 and 4 again, it says, I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And listen to this part right here. And they shall what? Fear no more. Why are you afraid? You shouldn't be afraid of nothing. Why? Because you got a shepherd. I can't, I think about fathers, parents in the home. What are your kids? Imagine them being afraid of someone when they got you in the house. To you, to them, you are the superhero. To you, you are invincible. To you, you are superman, superwomen. Why are they walking in fear under your tutelage? We're feeding you the word of God and we're feeding you faith principles so that you don't have to walk in fear. And you have examples who don't walk in fear. We don't walk in fear. 
Fear is the opposite of faith. And fear will stifle you. Fear will keep you at bay. It will stop you from receiving the things you need to get from God. So Jeremiah is saying, God said, I'm going to give you a shepherd. He's going to feed you. And because he's feeding you and caring for you, you're not going to fear no more. You're not going to be dismayed no more. Listen, you may have been wandering around. Man, I thank God when we first got in church, I'm like, wow, I got a pastor. I didn't know what that was. But oh my goodness, it kept me on the path. Just staying connected. And that's why my life just kept progressing, 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 because I never disconnected myself. 16 years of that ministry, I was so faithful. Faithful. Faithful on Sundays. Faithful at men's meetings. Faithful for special events. Faithful for rehearsals. I was in in a lot of stuff. I knew I was in my set place and I needed to grow. I need to develop. Amen. You come out of that world, you, you know, got to change your mind. So much, so much wickedness was on my mind from coming out of the world. How do you think you're going to hit and miss and get the evil out of you? How? You wonder why every now and then you go through this or you go through that. Get the evil out. Purge it. Stay consistent or sit up under this fountain long enough to drain it all out. Noah be dismayed. Look, neither shall they be what? Lacking. There's no lack in your life when you got when you got the right pastor. You lacking? How? We teach you principles so you don't have to lack. We teach you how to handle money so you don't have to lack. We teach you what the Bible says so you don't have to lack anything. And the Bible says it right here. Neither shall they be lacking, says who? No, Pastor AJ. (laughs) Jeremiah. Says the Lord. Well, Pastor, I'm lacking. Okay, then let's, let's evaluate. Let's examine ourselves. Let's examine ourselves. Let's, let's make sure that, that we are line upon line, precept upon precept. Because before I go to God, think about it. Before you go to that, to, 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 before you go and have a grievance that you're going to take up line, you better know you're right. You better make sure everything is in line before you take a grievance up line. Make sure that you looked over that email. Make sure. Did I say that? Did I? Let me make sure that I'm in line before I go to the Father because he see everything and know everything. Mm, mm, mm. Boy, I'm enjoying this this morning. This is good stuff right here. When you're properly connected, you don't have to fear, be dismayed. You don't have to be concerned. You don't have to worry about anything. Wow. And you will not lack. There is an unquestionable fact, listen to this, that is God's design to give grace through the life of another believer slash pastor. An unquestionable fact that God will give grace, a type of grace, through a believer or a pastor for another person's life. We know Philippians 1 and 7, I don't know if I gave them that, but at the bottom of that, Paul is speaking and Paul is saying at the end of that, at the end of that scripture, that you, that ye, he's talking to the Philippian church, that you are all partakers of my grace, of my grace. You are all partakers of my grace. He's talking to the Philippian church. You are all partakers of my grace. Now, not saving grace. Not saving grace, not the grace that comes from the Father. He, he's not giving you a grace to forgive. That's not, that, that's not the grace. The, the grace that comes from God is the grace that comes from God. He puts a grace on our life that we can, that you can connect through. Like, I believe my wife and I are connected to the grace that's on our pastor's life. We're connected to a grace that's on their life that's working for us as it's working for them. Are you following me this morning? So God placed, listen, I'm talking to Moses. Y'all know the book of Moses. I just pulled some things out the Lord was showing me. God placed the spirit, which which is an ability or a skill. He placed the spirit of Moses on 70 leaders. 
Back in Numbers chapter 11, you can take it down and read it later. Numbers chapter 11, 16 through 20. He placed the spirit of 70 leaders, or placed Moses' spirit on 70 leaders. God, why didn't you place your spirit on them? I mean, you got the best spirit, right? Of course he does. Why would you put Moses' spirit on those leaders or those that was connected? Because Mo they needed to flow in the grace that was on Moses' life. They needed to be able to flow like Moses flowed. You understand? Because they will be responsible for overseeing different amounts of people in, you know, at that time. So he didn't place his spirit on them. He connected them to, I believe, a special grace that came directly from the leader. Amen? Are y'all following me? Elijah. Think about Elisha and Elijah. Elijah, Elisha served Elijah faithfully for roughly about six years. This is in 2 Kings chapter 2. You can read 2 Kings chapter 2 to, to, to kind of follow up on this. He was known for the one, Elisha was known for the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. He was a servant, man. Who, and who would like to be known as a servant? Man, he was known as the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know, back in, I mean, man, you... You're a teacher's pet, man. You're sucking up to the pastor. Because he had other prophets that was in the area as well. You pouring hands on the man of God. I mean, come on, man. Can he wash his own hands? Can he pour water? Can he, can he carry his own Bible? Let's bring it to today. Can't they get their own tissues and napkins and handkerchiefs and washcloths? Can't can they carry their own stuff? No. He was known as a servant. Do you understand that they're serving in that capacity? See, you don't see that like you see ushers or greeters or AV, but it's the same. They're, they're just serving the man of God. That's their assignment. Like yours is media. Like yours is security. They are serving the man and woman of God. And shouldn't they do it to the best of their ability? Come on now. If you couldn't see the words, you couldn't see the scripture, you'd think it'd be a problem, right? We'd be checking the AV team. So, same thing, if I don't have what I need, my two, shouldn't I check them? I just want to say that publicly. No, I just, <laughs> no I have a great team. I have great <laughs> we got great people around us. Yeah, they get checked, though, I'm going to tell you right now. No, no. But no, no, no. He, look, he was a servant. He asked, this is what he asked Elijah. He asked Elijah if he could have a double portion of his, how dare you? How could you get... How, how can you get a double portion? Uh, how could he ask, even part his lips, to ask for a double portion of his spirit, the person he was serving? And then for Elijah to comply and say, well, I tell you what, if you see me when I go up. And then he tested him, because right after he said he wanted something, here comes the test. After you say you want some, here comes the test. After you say you want some, here comes the test. After you say you want something, here comes the test. They went through three different towns and three different times. Elijah told Elisha, who wanted the double portion, stay right here, man. I'll be back. Just stay right here. Elisha said, no, where you going? I'm going. Three different times. Because he told him, if you don't see me when I go up, how are you going to receive from me? So the test was, stay right here. Three different times he did it. Three different times. We know the story. Some of them know the story. Go back and read it, 2 Kings chapter 2. But the, but the short version is he did receive. He received a double portion. Now, Elijah did seven miracles, notable miracles in the Bible. It's recorded. Elisha did 28, doubled the miracles. It's in the Bible. It's recorded that he did double the miracles of his protege or of his master or of his father. He did double. So the double portion came on him. But it was through his connection. Now where you go, I'm going. Stay right here. No, I'm not staying right there. I'm going with you. Wherever you are, pastor, that's where I am. Whatever you're doing, pastor, that's what I'm doing. I'm following you. Are you a follower of a leader? A special grace fell on Elisha after Elijah was taken up. A special grace. A special grace. Esther chapter 4. We're going we're gonna to finish it up right here. 
Esther chapter 4. I thought this was really good when I, oh my goodness. Holy Spirit is, 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 is uh, he's a great teacher and a helper to give you what you need. He wants to help all of us to understand. And, and, and as a pastor, it's, it can be tough to teach something that you also benefit from. But for your sake, I have to do it. Not for me, for your sake, I have to do it. Amen? It says in verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes. Now they put a hit out on all the Jews. Just going to use a modern day term. They put Haman, he put a hit out on all the Jews. They, bought, they say on a certain day they were going to destroy all the Jews. So they put a hit out on all the Jews. And then, and then here's Mordecai, hey man, he's coming, to, he, he's, he's, uh, he's going through some stuff, and so let's, let's pick it up right here. When Mordecai learned all that happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried with a loud and bitter voice, or a bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Fa Listen to this. They were fasting, weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 4 says, so Esther's maid and Enoch came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. She was deeply distressed. Let's find out. So, look, she was distressed about what Mordecai was doing, so then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai. Listen, let's cover this dude up. Listen, I know this is my uncle. Let's cover him up. You understand? She was trying to actually shush him is what she was doing initially. Initially, she wanted to quiet him down, get him out of the public's eye. You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's quiet this guy. Let's, come on, let's get him some clothes. Put his clothes back on. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept it. Then Esther called ha uh, Hathik, one of the king's enoughs, whom he had appointed to attend, to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn, okay, since he didn't take the clothes, let's find out what he wants. Let's find out what's going on. To learn what and why this was. So, so I guess this guy went out again. To Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman, remember I told you Haman, Haman was the one who put a hit on everybody. Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So this guy again returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to him again and gave him a command for Mordecai. And the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put to death. Put to death, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called. This is Esther talking. I've not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Mordecai was not coming off of what he was saying. Do you think in your heart that you would, do not think in your heart that you would escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? Boy, I can bring this to modern. I can say some stuff right here, right now. Do you think do you think that you're going to escape because you're being silent? Do you think because you're rubbing shoulders with folk, you understand, that, that you're going to be okay when everything hits the fan? You think you're safe? You think you're safe going against the word of God, knowing you're a believer but hanging out with people that you know ain't going in the right direction? You think you're you, you you going to hold that position? You're going to hold that position? Es Mordecai is sharing this with Esther. She's the queen. She can really do what she want to do. She didn't have to listen to her uncle. She said, or he said, except the one the king holds and all that. So they told Mordecai, that's the words, and Mordecai, uh, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews, look, from somewhere else. 
Won't from your lips. You could have helped. You could have got that person free. You could have set them free through the word of God. They're going to get free, but not through you. The one that God could have used. He ain't going to use you because you, you, you're going to be silent. You're not saying nothing because you say something, it's going to expose you. Saying something will expose your position in Christ. And you want to be secret right now. Because in your heart, you know what's right. Man, I, I know this happened to somebody. I know this happened. Happened to everybody. Me too. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows where God put you in that position, not for yourself, but for the deliverance of other people? Who knows if God gave you that promotion, that business, that job, that assignment that's for, to be beneficial for other people outside of you? Who knows? You stay silent. How many people are going to perish because you thought the position was about you and not the kingdom? You thought the promotion was about your increase, not the increase of the souls that were around you. Yet who knows whether you will come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. She about to come to her senses. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, look, which is against the law. And if I perish... If this causes exposure, if me speaking out for the things of God or speaking out or doing what's right, it's going to cause me to perish. Even if I perish, I'm going to stand with the Lord. Even if I perish, I'm going to still say, well, thus saith the Lord. If I perish, this is what she was saying, because there's no guarantee that her husband will spare her, especially in the, in the face of everybody that's there. But if you know the story, you know he did. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. I'm sharing this story. I believe the Lord brought this story to me. Thank, thank, thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit, for all the other things that you shared as well. But um, I believe Esther received a special grace from her uncle. Esther walked in there with something else on her, not just her. Something else was on her when she walked in the room. She didn't just walk in there as that little, that young queen. Because her, her uncle, who was a leader in her house, in her life, because her parents had passed away and her uncle was raising her, he was a leader in her house. He was the one responsible for her. She took on his grace. Because she didn't know anything about this. She, she took on his grace. And when she walked in, she walked in under Mordecai's grace. And God protected her. God protected her. God protected her. <laughs> he empowered her. Look, look, he empowered her to step out even in the face of death. Something supernatural happens when you connect with the grace that's on your leader. When you connect with the grace that's on your pastors, something supernatural happens in your life. Amen? I, I'm going to stop right there. I got to stop right there. I'm out of time. Amen. Come on, get the Lord a hand, clap of praise. Welcome to our YouTube page. I'm Pastor AJ. This is my lovely wife, Pastor Tina. I am so excited that you visited our page. What you're going to find here is content related to how to build you up and encourage you, to edify you, to strengthen you. Amen. You're going to find the Word of God here, biblical principles for this time that we're living in. And listen, don't forget to subscribe to our page. Also, share it, comment, and listen, set a reminder so that anytime we post new content, you'll be the first to be notified. Amen. Well, God bless you and thank you for uh, coming to our page. We love you.